you know enough. You know enough working with your clients that you're not going to hurt them in some way. You're going to help them progress. Um, you have enough knowledge and education in terms of fitness and strength conditioning. It's like, okay, now explore other realms. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, your number one resource for all things fitness and performance in Switzerland. Today, we'll be chatting with Michelle Boland, who is a PhD, a certified strength and conditioning coach, and the owner of Michelle Boland Training, LLC. Michelle was previously the director of education at a private training facility and a strength and conditioning coach for a D1 collegiate institution, working with a nationally ranked top five women's ice hockey team, a nationally ranked top 10 men's ice hockey team, and other teams including field hockey, women's soccer, and men's basketball. She played soccer and basketball at the collegiate level while she completed a bachelor's degree in nutrition. Michelle also has a master's degree in strength and conditioning and a doctoral degree in exercise physiology. As an educator and as a mentor, Michelle guides coaches in their decision-making processes and helps them establish appropriate frameworks, systems, and models to organize and utilize the information that they acquire along the way. And Michelle, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I'm excited. No, it's a, it's a great pleasure. So going back to your, the kind of the early days of, of uh, you coaching, how did you get into coaching in the first place from being an athlete? Yeah, I feel, I feel like that's a typical journey is like a, you know, washed up athlete or something, get into strength conditioning. But um, I tore my ACL or pretty much everything in my knee um, my senior year of high school. In the summer going into college, so I was going to play um, collegiate soccer, I got really into the training aspect of it. So I was going through rehab, then I started lifting weights and seeing all these drastic changes. And I just fell in love with the, uh, fell in love with the process of doing that and making it a habit. And then I went to college, and my strength conditioning coach taught me in the field. And I took about two years off after college, and I applied and basically looked around at strength conditioning programs. And so, from uh, from that performance background, what do you what do you miss the most from that performance background as an athlete? As an athlete, I, I miss that lifestyle. I miss the training um, part of it. I miss pushing my body. I miss competing. I miss being around a group of people, especially as a strength conditioning coach as well in the D1 environment. I talk to a lot of people about just the difference between you know, general population and private training. Of course, there's a lot of pros and cons with everything. And then kind of when you're with like an elite group of athletes or athletes, there's so much practical knowledge that you gain from seeing how those athletes respond to things and making adjustments along the way. And through a competitive season, you know, there's so many coaches out there who may not go through an academic education, but they're they have so much probably more knowledge than other people who do because they get to interact with their athletes, train and sit down and really think through everything that an athlete has to go with. And I think there's so much um, to be said for that and so much that you gain while being in that, in that competitive environment when things are on the line. And uh, on, the, on the flip side of that question, what do you not miss about that competitive collegiate environment? Very quick answer here, probably the pay. <laughs> 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 okay, quick, quick and easy one. Uh, so I want to focus most of today's talk on what you do in terms of uh, education for coaches and, and mentorship. So when did you transition from, you know, just training your clients, training your athletes to actually starting to uh, put together everything that you had learned into education material for other coaches to, to benefit from? That's a good question. So um, I always wanted to be involved in education in some way. So when I was in school, I always thought um, when I was in the late years of my graduate program that I was going to be a professor at a exercise physiology or exercise science department or program. And I got a taste of it a little bit. I was a graduate assistant in the kinesiology program. I taught part-time um, like anatomy and some other courses. And I really did enjoy 
organizing information. I'm a very like analytical person. So I love sitting down and kind of making sense of various sources of information, organizing it in a way that someone else can benefit from in terms of learning that material. So I've, I've always been that type of person. And when I realized that I didn't want to be a part of the academic system, I spent a few years as a strength conditioning coach. And, you know, I would write in my notebook, I would sit down and mess around with programming and write down my thoughts about it. But it wasn't until I went to Dr. Ben House's functional medicine retreat in Costa Rica, and there was a group of you know, strength, and, in, strength and conditioning coaches there. And there was a few presenters. And I always thought, you know, what can I present that these people aren't already doing? Or, you know, I'm not going to be better than X when he or she is talking about a certain subject. And I think that was a bad approach to it. I just think I was pretty young. Um, I remember a conversation with Dr. Ben House, and he basically just said, like, you always have to start before you think you're ready. Um, just start writing. Start doing things. And I took what he said very seriously. I think I gained a lot of confidence. I gained a lot of insight into myself in that retreat. Like, who am I? What type of person am I? You know? What do I worry about? Um, how can I mediate those things? And after that, that's when I really tried pushing myself of producing content, putting things out, writing my opinion. Um, and then I started to really enjoy it. And that's what I pretty much found that I enjoy doing the most. Um, so that's when I've kind of pushed myself a little bit more in that realm. You talked about finding your identity through this retreat with, uh, with, uh, with Ben House. Um, for young coaches that maybe don't have access to such a great uh, retreat uh, opportunity, let's say, with other uh, kind of coaches around you to, to kind, of, uh, kind of show you the way, what do you recommend to young coaches uh, in terms of finding their own identity? Yeah, that's a difficult. I think it's not even just coaches. Everyone, I feel like, is a little bit lost in who they are. I don't think they take enough time to go through that process. A lot of the things... Well, what we did pretty much every morning at that retreat is um, we meditate in the morning, um, taking time for yourself and just being alone and with your own, own thoughts or I guess meditation is kind of removing thoughts. But I think it has a lot to do with expanding your knowledge and exploring things that are outside of the strength conditioning realm. Um, at, at a certain point, I even think it happens earlier than people think is you know enough you know enough working with your clients that you're not going to hurt them in some way you're going to help them progress um, you have enough knowledge and education in terms of fitness and strength conditioning it's like okay now explore other realms so explore psychology get better at um, understanding your behavior, how that's impacting someone else, understand other people's behavior, coaching. So I think it's, you know, and we all work with other people. We always, we want to help someone do something. And I don't think you can truly do that without understanding yourself first. Um, and probably a way to go about doing that is maybe taking time for yourself um, looking at resources that maybe personality tests, not in relation to, oh, this is the type of person I am, but kind of exploring how you respond to things. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses in terms of like interacting with people? Are you more introverted, like to spend time with yourself? Okay, if you understand that, then you know that when you go and coach a group of people or an individual, you have to become extroverted in some way. You have to have that person enjoy spending time with you. So you have to be, you know, have variability in your behavior to kind of interact, be enthusiastic, be someone people want to be with. But if you know that maybe you're a little bit introverted, you have to take time to kind of bring yourself down and spend alone time. I mean, pretty much talking about myself here, but you know, if I'm around people all day, that takes a lot of energy out of myself. 
So I make sure that I give myself some of that time back by, you know, being by myself or doing something that I want to do without other people around. Um, so you know, little things like that, one that are able to interact with other people and take care of yourself. I think it's communication skills, it's things that you like to do, what you're passionate about. I think a lot of people lack that. Um, and the willingness to pursue it. Um, and just kind of, I don't know, exploring other things outside of like fitness and really taking the time to think about yourself and how you can better yourself and your relationships. So once you get to that stage that you mentioned of, okay, I know enough to train my clients, I know enough to program, I know enough not to hurt them. Um, what would you recommend coaches spend in terms of kind of splitting their time between furthering their education within the fitness and, and health or nutrition realm uh, versus going and, like you said, exploring other things and looking for maybe something else to do that's completely out of the, the fitness world? How do you recommend one balances those two? Yeah, I think you should go through ebbs and flows. So um, there's two parts of, of learning in, you know, big categories. It's like acquiring and consolidating. And I think a lot of people go through the mistake of not consolidating information. So what I'll do is I'll go through periods where I'll go into things that have to directly relate on to like my day to day. Um, you know, programming, strength training. Um, like right now, um, or last month, I reread Franz Bosch's book, Strength Training Coordination. Um, and then I'll take a step aside and take some time off. And I'll probably read maybe a book about like marketing or um, I'm a big Jordan Peterson fan. I'll watch some of his lectures psychology professor and I'll kind of try to explore things that are outside the fitness realm and then actually I'll backtrack and I'll go back to maybe that fitness for conditioning book I was looking at and I'll take notes on it and kind of a lot of the information that I teach in my courses and the education I like to provide to trainers is so it's all about creating a filtering system or a framework to work from. So when I say, you know, coaches know enough at a certain point, it doesn't mean you stop learning. It just means you know enough to kind of be able to think through what you do with your clients. So you have this kind of either thing in your head or what I try to teach people is actually to put it in um, an actual document of, the model in which you make decisions around um, principles or phrases that um, you deem to be important in your training and your belief systems around training. And then it's okay. When I learn something new and when I sit down in my notebook, um, when I'm going through my consolidation period, I can take my principles and model and my foundation, basically my core system of about my beliefs towards training, what's important to me, what's important to be able to progress um, the people that I work with. And then I can take that information and I can ask myself, is this useful to me and the people I work with and my foundation? Is this a better way from which I do things? And if it's no, then I just, I leave out the information. If it's yes, then I integrate that information and consolidate it, update it, and I get better at what I'm doing. Because after all, it's um, we do the best we can until we know better. So if you find a better way, um, you should be adding that to what you do. However, you can't be so permeable where like you learn something new and it's like, okay, I, I do that the next day. And then you bounce around to different things. Um, so you have to go through that uh, kind of consolidation period uh, with, with learning and integrating things. And it's okay to not include new information. I think people are too quick with that. Um, you definitely can experiment with different things. I think a lot of your clients act as experiments to be able to um, see what works and what doesn't. Um, but don't be afraid not to include something. And you know, I, I kind of 
go through periods where I'm reading something. I went through a few years ago, I went through like a period where I was reading a lot of like quantum biology books and, and that's totally okay. It didn't relate to what I was doing on a day to day basis, <laughs> but it really resonated with me and I was very passionate about it. And if you are, then you pursue something. Um, so information definitely has to be meaningful to you and kind of like keep continuing to build that fire of your passion towards something. And, you know, when I read those books, I was thinking about it in relationship to like, you know, strength and conditioning, um, which was interesting, but I didn't like integrate that into my interactions with my clients or like my exercise selection choices. Um, so yeah, it has to both resonate with you and then it also has to be like meaningful to you. Um, so I think, I think that's a skill that um, people kind of need to develop over time. I don't think the academic system does a really, a really good job of that. No, I agree with you. I think it's a, it's a great point that that ebb and flow, especially because at the, when I started out, I felt really bad when, you know, I wasn't doing like, Oh, you have to read every single day. You have to write every single day. And I, like you, I went through periods of like three months where I would read two or three books a week. And I would be like, I didn't want to do anything but read. And I felt terrible because I thought, Oh, those, you know, marketers and whoever else says, Oh, you have to be consistent in every day. And then I would go through another phase of two or three months where I would just apply everything that I learned and just practice, practice and put out videos and, so if you look at it on the macro level and like a yearly level, I was consistent in the sense that I did all the things that I had to do, but not necessarily every day. It's, I, I feel like it's like that, that myth of balance where every day everything has to be balanced. No, you can't. It just doesn't work like that. But you can balance things on a, a bigger, with a bigger lens, like from a wider perspective. I, I, th I think that's totally okay to go through ebbs and flows. I think um, too much we're influenced by other people's opinions or perceptions of how we should behave or telling us that we need to do something. We all have kind of like buckets of things that are important to us. Like we have our relationships, we have maybe kids, family, um, fitness for ourselves, and then maybe like our job. And, you know, those buckets are kind of going to fill more than others at certain times and it's okay to just prioritize you know your family for a certain period of time and push off like learning to the side and go through those ebbs and flows and then and that's totally fine and it goes back to knowing yourself and knowing aspects of your life so if if i know you know the, this month is going to be really difficult for me with the clientele, uh, keeping up with my clientele or like family commitments, like it's okay to make sure that I understand that maybe the learning bucket has to drop, drop off a little bit. And I'm, and I have to be okay with that. Um, we can't, we can't do it all again, do the best we can. So we know better, but it's, it's okay prioritizing something else. Um, and I think that's an important thing. One of the books I'll probably suggest at the end of this talks about, you know, are you just, working to like maintain the choices that you've made in your life or is your life basically controlled by just wanting to make money through your career or is it just a way to you know fill the other buckets so do you want to just kind of live to make money or do you want to kind of have you know a life behind that and that's 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 all about like prioritizing your, your time and making sure you know it's like okay when you prioritize other things besides um, your avenue towards making money. You talked about you know acquiring information and then consoli consolidating it. How do you avoid the pitfall? And to quote uh, Bill Hardman, how do you date a system for a while but not marry it and just kind of fall feet first into it and be like, okay, this is the truth. This is the only thing that matters now. That's all uh, that I'm doing. How do you how do you avoid that side of things? Yeah. Um, so that is definitely, um, including a system, but not embedding yourself into a system for sure. So I think people are just too quick to grab onto something, um, probably because they don't have a solid, um, principle and model to like work from. They don't have a good framework. Um, so they're too permeable in their belief systems. So, I would say, and that, and again, going back to like the framework, 
it's a great way to make the most out of your continuing education and going to seminars because you're not going to just go to a seminar or learn a system and then just Monday try to basically do everything that they taught you. I think you should take time between learning a system and how to integrate it and slowly kind of decipher how the concepts. So really try to discern concepts from that information and how they fit into your training concepts. So for example, um, learning a system, it's maybe not just extracting single exercises, but if I know 10 different exercises from that, putting people in different positions, but doing the same thing, and maybe that relates better to maybe a performance environment or helping someone remove a limitation towards performance using that concept rather than just like the methods behind it. Um, yeah, and then, you know, a system, if there's multiple parts to a system, so say for example, a certain system has like 12 courses. Well, if you just go to one or two and you're like diving deep into it or like referring to yourself um, as like a person of that system or providing rationale um, in relation to just like describing that system, I think that's probably the biggest mistake people do. So what would you recommend instead, really just taking the time to consolidate what you learn before you integrate it into your kind of everyday practice? Yeah, making it your own. Um, turning maybe information that you learn into something that you understand or changing it to um, how you speak towards the level of your listener. So if, say, for example, you go and learn a system. A lot of systems use, I mean, I don't want to say like too much like jargon terminology, but if you're saying like a three-letter acronym to someone or if you're saying a phrase that's really not like common anatomy and using that as like a rationale or explaining something that way to your client, you're going to lose a lot of people. You're not explaining something to the level of the person who you're talking to. So taking that information and really cutting it down into something that you can explain from your past experiences or your foundational understanding and using basic terms to explain it to your clients. Um, I think that's something that takes skill and we really want to be able to do as, as trainers when we're um, trying to connect kind of complex things. The biggest thing that we can do is try to make them simple. Does content creation play a role in that as coaches? Should we kind of try to work on our material, synthesize what we learn, put it out into the world and kind of see what the reaction is, or should that be done kind of behind a closed door, just write for yourself and, and, and do it that way? I think there's, there's, there's both ways to that. I think putting something out takes a lot of, you know, guts and confidence and it's, it's important to be able to do. And I think you can get feedback that way. So you can kind of understand, um, maybe you can write something a little bit better. Maybe you lose people if a lot of people are asking questions about what you mean. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that for sure. Um, I think language selection is important of basically not diagnosing people or telling people something's wrong with them, with like what you're doing. You have to take a step back if you want to have like a beginner's mindset and say like, you know, none of the things I'm saying are actual facts or trying to be a little bit more open in your, in your language. Um, I think a lot of people learn systems and or like patterns that like anatomical patterns or physiological patterns that people are in and they'll box them into like right, wrong, or like there's something wrong with you, I'll fix you kind of language that's difficult um, for me. Um, it's just like avoid creating like maladaptive beliefs with the people that you're talking to. So me saying like, your pelvis is tilted a certain way. Well, that's kind of implying that there's like a right way and a wrong way and, and you're wrong, like there's something wrong with you. Um, that's probably the only thing that um, I can think of that I probably would like to avoid in like writing and content creation. 
Can you talk to us about the the influence that PRI had had on uh, your, let's say, belief system or, or view of training and anatomy in general? Yeah, absolutely. PRI stands for Postural Respiration Institute. It's, it's a system um, that gives you kind of like a lens to look through. And at the point in my life where I was learning about the system of PRI, I was in grad school and I was at the point where what I was learning at that time wasn't resonated, resonating with me. I really didn't think I wanted to be a strength conditioning coach at all, which is why I was going to pursue like a career in academics. Um, and then one of my biggest mentors was a professor there and he integrated, excuse me, his name is Dr. Pat Davison. He basically started introducing PRI to the students and you know, he was experimenting. He was starting to learn new information and consolidate it. And how you do that best is teaching it to other people in some ways. Um, so he kind of took us through some of the practical things and it changed the way I viewed anatomy. It changed the way I viewed movement and what we were doing in the weight room. And it showed me that we could do something different than the the things that I was learning and the kind of career that I thought strength conditioning was going to be. So it had a dramatic impact. And you know, I think I went through the majority of the courses. I think I went through 13 courses. Um, and that's when I really started to take continuing education very seriously when I started to explore those things. Um, and it, you kind of go through like this journey. You know, I was to someone the other day about, you know, when I was in school and like, the foundation of strength conditioning really started with, you know, muscle isolation. So a single muscle actions and how that's reflected in strategies and methods. And you can see that in the foundation of strength conditioning, which was a lot of like powerlifting and bodybuilding. And then kind of PRI, Shirley Sharman, and some other people started to talk about patterns or chains of muscles. And then you really saw strategies and methods of strength conditioning kind of change based on that information. And now a lot of the things that are creating a trajectory in this field relate to like opening and closing spaces, um, fluid movements and volume changes. And now we're seeing kind of how we're using resistance to in coordinated movements to kind of create changes in, um, in volume and fluids and looking a little bit at physics. And I think it just kind of leads in this trajectory of understanding and PRI was really something that, that kicked that off for me and had a huge influence on that. And so what's your perspective now that you've kind of from the beginnings uh, or your beginnings in the PRI kind of world, um, how has your view, your view changed uh, since then? I think it's an understanding of all about performance in the beginning. So say, for example, before I kind of learned PRI, I think a lot of things in my lens were focused at moving more load and that's going to make you a better athlete or jumping higher in a, from a stationary position is going to make you a better athlete. Kind of just these objective data changes with kind of isolated muscle targeting or um, pushing or progression with load. And I think learning PRI and the everything after has made me kind of change the lens towards, okay, Especially with performance, we're talking about like coordinated movement. We're talking about skill, like motor learning skills. And then at our job is to teach those things and then maybe add resistance with them, but also not towards the straight trajectory of performance, but also addressing things that represent limitations to performance. So being able to kind of assess and dissect um, maybe how someone's lacking something and how that's impacting their inability to make that progression towards improved performance or improved movement. You talked about Pat being uh, one of the people that, that taught you and, and one of your, your mentors. For you, what's the role of mentors in the learning process for, for a coach? They, they provide a different set of experiences, knowledge, and 
they're really good at being able to identify gaps like by just prompting questions. You know, I could use the word position, but if they ask me what position is, am I able to explain that? Um, and that carries over into everything. Um, so, and, and they can kind of question things in a polite, um, well-mannered way. Um, so they can ask you why you're doing things and then reflect on their experiences, which usually a mentor has more experience than you um, in a practical setting and give you a different lens to view things through and expose you to different things. And I think that's invaluable and something you really can't get with, you know, just reading a book. How do you find a good mentor? That's great. So I think technology this day and age is changing that where you can actually seek out people who you um, are learning from, who you kind of trust in a certain way, who you can create a relationship with digitally. Um, you know, back, back in the day, a few years ago when I was in grad school, I think I was just lucky enough to identify with people. Maybe that was something I was good at. I could identify someone who I could learn something from and I would kind of stick with that or stay with it. Um, there was my graduate assistant, professor, professor, uh, excuse me, professor. Um, it was someone who I really attached to and taught me a lot. And I, I trained the president of the college that I work with and she was just one of those individuals who was so willing to um, provide things to me with like future kind of things to consider, um, talking through like a thought process and giving me very like personal mentorship um, experiences. And then, you know, Dr. Pat Davison was something, someone who I didn't seek out and kind of just, you know, was there. I was lucky enough to have that. And he was doing something a different way. And I think maybe that's something that people can be open-minded to. When you see someone doing a different way, maybe really try to see what they're all about instead of um, not really wanting to learn something new. Um, but, this, but this day and age with technology, you can really read someone's content, kind of go through experiences with them digitally and then reach out and create a relationship and you can kind of I think interact with a lot more people than you were able to have access with before what are the one to three books that have had the biggest impact on you as a coach so some books that I would definitely recommend and had a huge influence on me I think when I first started off in the strength conditioning field I think Two of the most foundational books were Triphasic Training by Cal Deeds and Joel Jameson's NMA Conditioning. Those were awesome. I think as I got later into my coaching career, I think one of the books that impacted me the most in terms of strength conditioning was Strength Training and Coordination by Franz Bosch. Um, it kind of trains, changed my lens a little bit from like, you know, again, going back to like heavy loading or just like really looking at movement and then how we were creating strength or resistance in that movement and how that was leading to performance. Um, and then I think one of the, this is the fourth recommendation here, the best book personally that's had a huge impact on me is the book called Your Money or Your Life. Um, I forget the author's name, but I'm sure you can find it on Amazon. Oh, and again, that was, yeah. And, and that was kind of related to the topic of, getting to know yourself through how you want to live your life and it makes you go through thought processes it prompts a lot of like it gives you like assignments and it prompts a lot of questions related to do you want money to control you or um, what do you want your life to be and it really really makes you think about that stuff um, so I would highly recommend that book um, what do you like in the current performance and and coaching fields. What, what are some of the good things that are happening right now from your perspective? Um, probably diving deep into change of direction and multi-directional speed in a, a very different way than kind of what I'm used to. I think one of the best online courses I, I've taken is uh, Lee Taft. And I think some of the work that I think your previous guest, Justin Moore, is like doing with exploring 
um, what's actually happening when you load into a cut and when you come out of a cut and how you can really create strategies and methods through your training and programming that will drastically improve someone's ability, especially on field ability. And that's what it's all about. Not just kind of putting more weight on people and making people quote unquote stronger with load. Cause that really won't have an impact on multi-directional speed and things like that for athletes. So I think a lot of that work is like super important. So again, Justin Moore, and then um, one of our mutual friends who's a, just got his DPT. His name is Mike Cambarini. He has amazing information related to kind of really looking at anatomy through um, expansion and compression and changing fluid and volumes by putting yourself in certain positions and really allowing that to make some drastic improvements in performance and addressing limitations to performance. And then to me, one of the best, I kind of want to drop his name here. He's like one of those guys where he's probably the best strength conditioning coach I have ever been around, but like no one knows who he is. And I think he just started like an Instagram account a few days ago. Uh, his name's Dan Sanzo. And I think his account's like strategic training or something like that. Um, but he's one of those guys who has learned – like PRI and all of the, really the continuing education that's like top level right now. And he can integrate that information and turn it into practical things that you can do with people. Um, and I think those are the people that you should really like learn from um, because that is a high level skill. Yeah. It, it almost seems going back to what you were saying before in terms of kind of the direction that the, maybe the, the, maybe not the ground floor or the foundation of, but kind of the, the train of thought within the, the, the fitness and the, the performance world uh, where we went from, like you said, isolating muscles and looking at the kind of dead guy anatomy and, and lever systems. And now we're talking about, like you said, fluids and, and, and volumes and, and more kind of the physics side and integrating all that information into like a very complex system with some rules that are maybe different than the ones we were looking at before. And, those people are kind of pushing it in that direction. Yeah, it may not change exactly what you do, but it provides a much deeper level of understanding. And again, it's a skill to maybe be able to change the language that's being used towards the level of like uh, your listener. And I think that's a big skill as well. Yeah, it's interesting because in, as a parallel to that, recently i was exposed to all the all the stuff coming out of, of moxie uh, monitoring and what's yeah. going on at the local level in in real time in terms of oxygen consumption that kind of begs the question is the like the current model of energy systems on the on the graph does that work that way and kind of putting things in, in a different perspective but it doesn't mean that you throw the baby out with the bathwater. like the, we know that the the training methods work most of the time for most people, yes. but now we maybe have a better why behind the, those things that we do every day. So what we do every day doesn't change, but our understanding of it does. Oh, absolutely. That was a perfect example of that. It's like, you know, I wanted to learn about Moxie for my own interests because, you know, I'm passionate about it, but has it changed what I've done on a day to day basis? No, it's just provided me with a greater understanding, you know, mostly because, um, in my context, um, I wasn't going to um, be able to facilitate like a MOXIE unit or change my entire day-to-day -day practice to this one piece of technology. But like just learning about it has definitely um, improved my understanding of what we're doing with people when we're doing conditioning and, um, you know, building capacity, especially like peripheral to, you know, central changes. So if we, if we flip that question upside down, what, uh, can you talk about some of the things that you see today in the, in the training world that you're not too fond of? Um, it's really, um, I don't think I get too riled up. I don't really let anything bother me too much, um, especially um, social media wise. But I think going back to what I said a little bit ago, I think one thing that does kind of is something that I personally want to 
not do. So I think seeing it is something that I'm like, okay, like this is something that I don't want to do is I want to be very careful with my language on how I talk to people. So like one of my training principles has to do with relating movement to just shape change and telling people that things are good or bad for them is something that I think should be avoided. Like, Oh, if you do split squats, um, you're going to hurt your knees or, um, if you hold the bar this way, you're going to hurt your shoulders. Um, you know, things like that, like telling people that something bad is going to happen or, hey, your pelvis is in the wrong position. Um, if you don't fix that, this could lead to that. And it's like you're telling basically someone that something's wrong with them. And I don't think that's the language that, that we should be using with our clients or basically within like the fitness community. Where can people find out more about you and what you do and what you offer for coaches in terms of education, continuing education and, and mentoring? Oh, awesome. So I'm pretty active on Instagram. It's dr.michellebowen. And right now I just kind of released my exercise second edition of my exercise database, which is like this huge collection of like over 500 training videos that are private but you have my permission after you purchase it to really grow your online training business providing your clients with instructional videos so you can kind of remove that communication barrier with people um, and then also i have the wait list up for my next um, what i called my strategy course so i made an online educational course relating to a lot of things that we talked about today like actually taking the time out, stepping, stepping back from commute, continuing education and learning like different things about methods maybe, and taking a step back and actually being able to create a framework to be able to make those things more valuable in the future. So this is where we really talk about principles, models, and then turning that into a training system related to how do your strategies and methods reflect your principles and models, which connects what you deem to be important in training. Um, my next live like classroom starts in the fall and it's a 12 week long like interactive course. And um, we have a lot of great conversations. Okay. I'll make sure to link that in the description of the podcast for all the coaches that might be interested in checking it out. Thanks so much for your time today, Michelle. Thanks. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure to talk to you soon.